Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the so-called nuclear experts get it wrong. This week, in honor of Hiroshima Day on August 7th, We focus on the ongoing dangers of nuclear weapons in an interview with Dr. Catherine Thomason, Executive Director of Physicians for Social Responsibility. Then, award-winning journalist Carl Grossman, our aminance grise in the history of all things nuclear, fills us in on a breakthrough in a space propulsion system that has the power to take nuclear power permanently out of interplanetary exploration. Those interviews, plus numbnuts of the week, will be coming up in just a few minutes. Today is Tuesday, August 5th, 2014, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. The Department of Defense's final report to the Congressional Defense Committees on radiation exposure for the USS Ronald Reagan sailors after they sailed to Japan on an humanitarian aid mission after the earthquake and tsunami on March 11, 2011, has finally come out, and it shows that over 1,750 Navy sailors are shown to suffer from quote-unquote ill-defined conditions after exposure to Fukushima radiation while aboard the USS Reagan. Among the illnesses showing significant increases in these sailors are diseases of the respiratory system, digestive system, genitourinary system, male infertility, complications of pregnancy, childbirth, puerperium, which is the six-week period after birth, symptoms, signs, and ill-defined conditions. These are not otherwise specified and of unknown etiology. Additional diseases and symptoms listed in the report as showing up among these sailors in larger numbers and greater percentages than in the control population are disorders of the thyroid gland, male genital organs, female infertility, certain conditions originating in the perinatal period, which is immediately before and after birth, and spontaneous abortion. The lawsuit against Tokyo Electric Power Company on behalf of 112 sailors of the Reagan who have become ill, including one who has, since the filing of this suit, passed away, will be held in San Diego Federal Court on August 19, 2014, at 1.30 in the afternoon, and Nuclear Hot Seat will be there to cover it. Another story we've been covering is of the radiation spill that happened on February 14 at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP, site in Carlsbad, New Mexico. We know that one barrel of waste from Los Alamos National Laboratory that was brought to the WIP site exploded, imploded, something happened, but it seemed to have caught fire And that was what released radiation that then was released into the environment when the HEPA filters did not kick in in time in the emission stack. Now, the Department of Energy is making it official and has given the EPA's hazardous waste number to WIP for the characteristic of ignitability of some nitrate salt-bearing waste containers that have been deposited in WIP. This affects up to 368 containers. Note that the facility, the only waste repository in the country for low-level nuclear materials, has been closed since February 14 because of a problem with one barrel. And now there are 368 others to contend with. EPA hazardous waste specialist Daniel Storr said, There is a significant fire risk due either to their low flashpoint, ability to self-combust and burn, or are able to combust or support combustion. New Mexico Environmental Department Secretary Ryan Flynn said in testimony before the New Mexico State Legislature 
that the material holding the bags of magnesium oxide together had been on top of the drums and they just disintegrated. By all indications, he added, the area got very hot very quickly. When questioned at the Carlsbad, New Mexico town meeting, Russell Hardy, who is director of the Carlsbad Environmental Monitoring and Research Center, said, We will probably see spikes at Station B as contamination makes its way out of the repository. Additional funding from the Department of Energy has allowed an expansion of ambient air sampling sites, so there will be three, count them, three additional ambient air sampling towers, one in Carlsbad. According to Russell Hardy, we think those three additions will give us much better coverage in the future with respect to how this release or the potential for future releases may impact the area. So they're expecting future releases and G from February 14 to July 24 when this town meeting took place is five months and 10 days. And in that time, nobody knows exactly what radiation may have additionally come out because there were no additional measuring stations. Based on my experience at Three Mile Island, we will never know exactly how much radiation was released. I'll skip the music this week, but my nature is again on the rampage and furious at us all. In Santa Cruz, the Marine Mammal Center has seen a record-breaking number of patients this year, with 727 sea lions being admitted through July, when in 2013 the center admitted only 521 animals. Huge increase. A record number of sick seals, 658 to date, were treated at the Morrow Bay Rescue Center. Experts say the seals are suffering from either starvation or poisoning from toxic algae or something something. But not a one of them has said the F word. Fukushima. One of the reasons these animals may be starving is the same reason that Santa Cruz has declared an emergency situation in its harbor, and that is that hundreds of thousands of dead anchovies are floating to the surface. According to the harbor master, this is the worst fish kill in Santa Cruz since the 1980s, and the third die-off in three weeks. Millions of anchovies died overnight in the Santa Cruz Yacht Harbor. State Fish and Wildlife aren't 100% sure what caused this latest fish kill, but they're certain it wasn't natural. But that did not stop local television station KSBW from saying on air, it's not Fukushima. No one explained where they got that little tidbit of information from. Nor did the blogger who opined, this is a sign that the anchovies along our coastline are doing good. Ah, yeah, ah, yeah. And there are now more reports coming in from fishermen that they are seeing debris that is evidently from Fukushima floating in the ocean. Southwest of Langara Island in British Columbia, there were reports of waist-high piles of debris filled with catastrophic death. One fisherman said, the drift nets have got everything in it dead. It's bad, real bad. That all comes across from Fukushima. The currents are big, bringing everything in. We see tide lines for 10 to 15 miles of just rows of stuff floating. When asked if the fishermen were given any warning by the Canadian government that what they were looking at could be radioactive or dangerous to their health, he responded, no. According to Southern California Edison, in order to dismantle the shuttered San Onofre nuclear power plant, it is estimated that the work will take two decades and cost $4.4 billion. But spent radioactive fuel, which still has plenty of plutonium in it and is still deadly, will be held at the site indefinitely. That's the best that Southern California Edison could come up with. Now, the California Public Utilities Commission must approve the deal, and the CPUC is headed by its president, Michael Peavy, who's the former president and lobbyist for Southern California Edison. You can bet there's plenty of pork in that bottom line.
Let's get some good news going. The Navajo Nation has blocked a backdoor deal that would have allowed uranium mining to restart, despite lingering waste from past mining and a reservation-wide ban that's been in place since 2005. Last week, the Navajo Nation Council voted to rescind legislation passed in December by an unauthorized committee. That deal would have allowed a Colorado-based company called Uranium Resources Incorporated to conduct on-site mining on private lands near Church Rock at the eastern edge of the Navajo Nation in New Mexico and then transport the uranium across Navajo Trust lands. Congratulations to Leona Morgan, an activist with Dina No Nukes, and the others who worked on this issue. Now here's this week's Nuclear Hot Seat. Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that sound weak. The Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, offered its workers a Southern Accent Reduction class. The email pitch for the speech rehab program read, Feel confident in a meeting when you need to speak with a more neutral American accent and be remembered for what you say not how you say it. Cost of class per participant would have been $805. Compare that with the fact that when 84-year-old nun sister Megan Rice proved the lack of security on the site by breaking in, defending herself with nothing more than a Bible and two friends who joined her in prayer, She was considered to have done over $1,000 in damage, for which she, at 83 years old, was sentenced to 35 months in prison. Because of complaints, Oak Ridge did cancel the opportunity for people to participate in this class, thus saving themselves $805 per potential participant. Would that they could apply that money towards the charges against Sister Rice and get her out of jail early. What a bunch of petty, misplaced priorities. And that's why the Human Resources Department at Oak Ridge National Laboratory is this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that sound a week. Joseph Mangano, the epidemiologist, and Dr. Janet Sherman have a new article up on counterpunch.org. In it, they pull no punches, saying there is virtually no health research being conducted or released on harm to the Japanese over three years since the Fukushima nuclear disaster began. They go on to analyze the slight amount of data that has been released and compare it with the study they did three years ago that raised the initial alarms about the health impact of radiation from Fukushima. We'll have a link up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this week's episode, number 163. Lots on radiation at Fukushima. A new report estimates that 278 trillion becquerels of plutonium have been released from Fukushima reactors. That's over 200 times higher than the amount reported by TEPCO. According to Dr. Helen Caldicott, one millionth of a gram of plutonium will give you lung cancer if you inhale it. How does one wrap one's head around 278 trillion becquerels of plutonium? On Thursday, July 24th, Asahi Shimbun reported that more than 1 trillion becquerels of radioactive substances were released into the environment over a period of four hours during debris-clearing work at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. The estimates were made by monitoring results in downwind areas and also took into account the fact that alarms for highly contaminated dust concentrations sounded for four hours straight. According to NHK, utility tunnels between the number two and three reactors and the Pacific Ocean are estimated to hold a total of 11,000 tons of radiation-contaminated wastewater that was used to cool the melted fuel. This highly radioactive water has been reaching the soil and seeping out into the Pacific. The Nuclear Regulatory Authority, or Japan's NRA, 
instructed TEPCO to pump out contaminated water in the trenches as early as possible. Too late for that. And members of the NRA urged that the effort be speeded up, as some expressed doubt as to whether the plant's operator TEPCO even has a sense of crisis. Environmental Science and Technology, which is a publication of the American Chemical Society, hardly a group of radicals, published an article, Novel Insights into Fukushima Nuclear Accident from Isotopic Evidence of Plutonium Spread Along Coastal Rivers. That's almost longer than the item itself. They confirm that plutonium originating from Fukushima could be transported relatively long distances from the damaged power plant and is already being supplied to coastal rivers, thereby representing another potential source of plutonium contamination to the Pacific Ocean. The group recommends that similar analyses should be conducted on river sediment samples collected in coastal rivers draining into this area. This same article went on to state that Fukushima globally enhanced, what a nice way of putting it, globally enhanced cesium-137 levels in the air by two to three orders of magnitude, that the radioactive plume that reached Europe contaminated the land and, as a consequence, the whole food chain, and that concentrations were greatly underestimated. Traces of radiation from Fukushima have been observed in the Euro-Arctic area, and contributors to this report included Finland and Norway hardly hotbeds of anti-nuclear activism. And in a true, through-the-looking-glass, bizarro world story, experts, put that in quotes, experts worry that radiation fears are leading to unnecessary surgery for children in Japan. And they're saying that the thyroid screenings are alarming parents and children when the alarm does not need to be rung. In other words, the reason the kids are showing so many nodules and cysts and cases of thyroid cancer is that they're being tested for it. If they weren't tested, it wouldn't show up and they would be fine. Talk about blaming the victims. What planet are these people from? And shame on the Japan Times for publishing something that so downplays the actual pain and suffering that these children and their families are going through. As for the suffering of the children at the hands of nuclear perpetrators, Dr. Ian Fairley, an independent consultant on radioactivity in the environment, has published a new study on childhood leukemias near nuclear power stations. It is filled with a lot of information. We're going to have a link, but more importantly, all things being equal, by next week, there will be an interview with Dr. Farley on nuclear hot seat number 164. And I invite you to tune in and listen to this important evaluation of the impact of nuclear reactors on our kids' health. A reminder that nuclear hot seat relies on your support to keep bringing you the anti-nuclear news every week. We need donations to cover such things as bandwidth charges, website security, travel expenses to cover stories like the upcoming hearing in San Diego for the USS Reagan sailors when TEPCO is trying to dismiss their case. Then there's web hosting and so much more. So if you haven't yet donated or you would like to help out again, just go to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down on the homepage, and click on the big red donate button. Your assistance will go directly to helping me help you keep up to date on all things anti-nuclear. Now for this week's interviews. Catherine Thomason is Executive Director of Physicians for Social Responsibility and has worked with that group for over 30 years. A former president of the Board of Oregon PSR and co-president of the National PSR Board, she has been speaking and advocating on the group's issues from nuclear weapons abolition, cleaning up the Hanford Nuclear Reservation, and on Iran following her trip there in 2007. Her credentials are truly too extensive to cite here if I want to have time left for our interview and the rest of the show. With Hiroshima Day, 
the anniversary of the first wartime use of an atomic weapon, happening on August 7th, we spoke about nuclear weapons, nuclear war, and the dangers we all still face. Catherine Thomason, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Tell me about PSR's history on nuclear weapons and how or why doctors got involved with this issue in the first place. That's an important question. That's, that's the founding of this organization. And it came about from a Nobel Prize winner in 1959, speaking to a group of physicians about his concern that nuclear war would occur and it would annihilate everyone on the planet. Philip Noel Baker received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1959 as a campaigner for peace and international cooperation. He himself did not do anti-nuclear work, but he brought up the issue of even the fact that testing of nuclear weapons over the Nevada test site, in the Marshall Islands, in the Soviet Union at that time, and elsewhere was causing radiation to be released worldwide and was going to affect health. One of our founders, Dr. Bernie Lown, went to this talk and was deeply moved by it and felt that he should take action and called together a group of physicians in the Boston area and research some of this information, as physicians usually like to know what they're talking about, and realized that plutonium and uh, other fallout elements uh, were being found in children's baby teeth and other elements were found in other types of land and food and water that was essentially contaminating and causing human harm. With that information and talking about the destructive power of these weapons, which is just so much greater than any other type of weapon, and publishing this in the New England Journal of Medicine, these doctors became instant experts and helped to raise awareness that duck and cover wasn't going to help, that nobody was going to survive a nuclear attack on a city like New York, Boston, or, or Washington, D.C., and that pretending that we could protect ourselves from such an attack was ludicrous. And through that push, President Kennedy signed unilaterally in 1962 the Atmospheric Test Ban Treaty that the United States would no longer test nuclear weapons above ground and contaminate, frankly, everyone in the world. That's how PSR got involved. It's a health issue. Nuclear weapons are very bad for your health. How realistic is it to still be concerned about nuclear war? Unfortunately, I think it's very realistic. The possibility of war between Russia and the United States is certainly less than it used to be during the Cold War, but there's a very real possibility of an accidental nuclear war. There have been at least five incidents since 1979 when either Moscow or Washington was prepared to start a nuclear war in the mistaken belief it was already under attack. The most recent known incident was in 1995, a full five years after the fall of the Berlin Wall. So that's one aspect, and of course, Russia and the United States have the greatest numbers of uh, nuclear weapons. The total number of weapons in Russia and U.S. arsenals range as high as 17,000. The other concern that we have is that other countries will use nuclear weapons, and the Ongoing war and skirmish between uh, India and Pakistan, for example, over the province of Kashmir is very real for the potential of using nuclear weapons there. Nuclear weapons anywhere is a threat to everybody in the planet. PSR recently put out two reports on the humanitarian impact of a limited, I don't know how you can limit it, but what is referred to as a limited nuclear weapons exchange and together, these two reports have refined our knowledge of nuclear weapons use and how it impacts the entire planet. Tell us about those two studies. The two studies came out of the fact that back in the 70s and the height of the Cold War, we knew that major use of nuclear weapons would cause what was called as a nuclear winter, that 
so much dirt and soot would be thrown way up in the stratosphere, blocking the sun, causing a drop, an acute drop in temperature, and impacting agriculture everywhere. We know that happened with one of the largest volcanoes in the last centuries in Indonesia, that it caused frosts to occur in July and August, caused famines in countries in Europe and in the United States. And that effect lasted for about a year. And these reports, we felt, well, what is a plausible nuclear encounter? If Pakistan shot up to 50 nuclear weapons at India and India did the same, using the assumption that the weapons are approximately the size of the Hiroshima bomb so that we knew we would know how much soot and carbon it would throw up into the atmosphere. And we now have very sophisticated climate modeling. So the first study looked at the impacts of the amount of soot that would be thrown into the atmosphere and the fact that it would actually last up to 10 years and would impact, um, they looked at corn, soy, and rice, and the decrease in output, agricultural output of these grain crops, were a drop of 10 to 15 percent on average for up to 10 years. Well, we know that over 800 million people in the world are marginally fed currently, are malnourished, So looking at the sociological picture, it was estimated from those initial studies that up to a billion people would be at risk of starvation from what the scenario is calling a limited nuclear war, the use of only, if one could say only about nuclear weapons, only 100 nuclear weapons. Additional studies were done by Dr. Alan Robach and others published in peer-reviewed journals looking at wheat crops, and it turns out that wheat crops are even more sensitive to this climate cooling. And the second round of studies showed that the wheat crops in the United States and particularly in China, which is actually the largest wheat producer in the world, would drop by 30% for up to 10 years. Well, this starts getting into the area of grain export, There are many countries that are not able to feed themselves, such as Malaysia or Japan, and they have to import grain. So it then starts impacting much larger portion of the population. And so it's estimated that 2.3 billion people could be affected by starvation from a limited nuclear war in countries over which the United States or other countries have no control. Well, this is devastating information. I just wrote down, nuclear war is the cure to global warming, but not one we would like to have. (laughs) Right. I've I've heard that line every time I've presented this information, but unfortunately it only lasts 10 years, and we wouldn't want to repeat this again in 10 years. And, of course, the numbers of people that would die in India and Pakistan, the total loss of hospital systems and ability to care for the remaining survivors – and the fallout that would occur in the surrounding countries, uh, of course, would also be incredibly devastating. Nuclear weapons are a class of weapons that are so grave that the International Court of Justice has ruled that any use of nuclear weapons should be considered contrary to the principles and rules of international humanitarian law. It appears that this information has galvanized the international movement to take more action on nuclear weapons. Who are the drivers of this movement? The drivers are a number of countries that have felt and have actually helped support some of this research, uh, Norway, Austria, and others who feel very strongly that we need to take action to protect everyone, the globe, all populations. In addition, the International Red Cross and Red Crescent, the ICRC, has moved even further down the pathway and has taken up this issue in a very robust way. They have passed a resolution stating that all their affiliates should engage in education of the populations that they serve, that nuclear war and the use of nuclear weapons is an event that the best agency in the world The Red Cross cannot manage a disaster like this. There is no 
possible way that anybody can manage such a disaster. And so people should be educated and governments should be moved to develop policy to eliminate all nuclear weapons. Another major force is ICANN, which is the International Campaign for Abolition of Nuclear Weapons, which is an offshoot of our international organization, the International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War, that has been campaigning on this and educating civil societies so that they and the governments have held a series of conferences to educate the government officials themselves about this information. So that's been very, very exciting. So the first conference of its type was held in Oslo, and there was a huge civil society conference alongside of it. And the second one was held this last February in Nayarit, Mexico. And in both circumstances, PSR and our IPPNW have been encouraging the United States government to send a representative as well. And did we? Unfortunately, we did not. Our government felt pushed by the various organizations that are trying to get them to engage on this process by actually letting us know that, well, they're concerned that this kind of movement is going to undermine the negotiations that are going on in the Non-Proliferation Treaty. To remind our listeners, you know, we have a treaty that was signed decades ago uh, of which Article 6 states that all nuclear weapons countries will, in good faith, continue to conference and move towards the elimination of nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, most of us feel that those proceedings have stalled, that we're not getting anywhere, and that other countries, such as North Korea, the activities in Iran, more and ongoing development of, of nuclear weapons in Pakistan, delivery systems in China, India, are all being upgraded. So the concern that we're moving towards more nuclear weapons or more countries holding nuclear weapons increases the threat. So the, the current system is not addressing the issue of reducing and removing the threat. So the last event in uh, Nayarit, Mexico, basically there were 146 governments represented. Three-quarters of the nations of the world participated in uh, what they call the Second Humanitarian Impact of Nuclear Weapons Conference, um, wow. which is very exciting. That's terrific, and of course, we heard nothing about it in the media. Well, nothing except what some of our organizations write. So PSR and representatives from IPPNW have been writing opinion editorials on this and trying to get the attention of major newspapers, national newspapers. We've conferenced and met with the national security staff of the Obama administration. We've met with Undersecretary Rose Goth Miller, who manages nuclear weapon systems, and really letting them know that more and more people are concerned. One of the other activities that we feel is important is to engage other organizations within civil society to take up this charge. The Rotarian Action Group for Peace, which is a uh, component within the International Rotary, has signed on and is encouraging its members to educate Rotarians and the public about this issue, again, to put more and more pressure on our government so that we can reduce this threat and hopefully, in my lifetime, eliminate nuclear weapons. What other actions? has the international movement done thus far? Well, there's the World Congress of the International Trade Union Confederation, which is a group of 1,500 trade unionists from 161 countries. Also, in just several months ago in May 2014, adopted a resolution calling for urgent negotiations on a treaty to ban the use, manufacture, stockpiling and possession of nuclear weapons as a first step towards their complete eradication. Likewise, the U.S. Conference of Mayors in June, just a month ago, unanimously adopted a resolution supporting the Marshall Islands lawsuit, urging the United States to participate in good faith on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons conference systems. And, of course, that brings us to the, the Marshall Islands lawsuit, 
the Marshall Islands, which is where a lot of U.S. nuclear testing occurred, devastating the ecosystem, eliminating some islands because they were completely uh, destroyed. I think the Bikini Atoll was one of the areas that they were testing the bombs in. Absolutely. So the, the Marshall Islands, as an entity, brought suit in the International Court of Law as well as in the United States against all nuclear weapons countries, stating that they are not taking action to eliminate them. So we will see what will happen from those lawsuits, and that is getting a significant amount of worldwide press. Again, I'm not seeing a whole lot of it here in the United States. I'm dumbfounded by the U.S. position in relationship to the international meetings and the movement. Is there any place at all where we might be able to leverage a bit more attention on the part of our own government? Absolutely. Absolutely. I would encourage all the listeners here to call the White House and let them know that you are extremely concerned about your future and the future of your children and the threat of nuclear weapons and encouraging President Obama to send a representative to the upcoming meeting, so the third round of conferencing will occur in Vienna this December, and we really feel that the United States should be represented there. That would be a lovely petition to get going and a lovely campaign to throw to groups like the Coalition Against Nukes to see what we can do to get it around to the local activists. NEARS would also be a good one to get involved for their grassroots connection on it. And, of course, anything we can do here on Nuclear Hot Seat to pass the information on, please, it's an open door for you and for the organization. That's great. And you can find that information in the petition on PSR's website, psr.org, and click on the tab for nuclear weapons and take action. Let's go back to a, a few other points to cover. Why are we looking for a ban treaty? Isn't there the movement to disarm through the Non-Proliferation Treaty? How do these relate to each other? Well, a ban treaty, like the ban treaty on chemical weapons or landmines, for example, sends an extremely strong message to governments. So the U.S. has not signed on to the landmine treaty, and yet we are not exporting landmines anymore. So it basically tells governments that these weapons are felt to be immoral, that they should never be used, that they really target the public. They don't target military targets. And so they really shouldn't be used. And so if there were a ban treaty on nuclear weapons, it would send the same type of message and would speed negotiations about how we can eliminate them. We're coming up on Hiroshima Day, the anniversary on August 7th. Are there events going on? Are there actions that people can take? And if so, what can they do to participate in having their voices heard? Hiroshima Day and Nagasaki Day are very somber reminders of the devastation of nuclear weapons where an entire city was completely destroyed with ongoing radiation effects. And many cities in the United States have events commemorating them and encouraging people to take action. On our website, we have a calendar of those types of events. Um, so you can go on our website and see where events may be in your locale. So that is certainly one way. Writing letters to the editor. So the one time when our American press does cover nuclear weapons issues tends to be around Hiroshima Day. So this is perfect timing to write a letter to the editor telling them, how come you're not carrying stories about this worldwide movement called the Humanitarian Impacts Initiative? We want to hear about this. This is news. And it's time to eliminate nuclear weapons. And the U.S. should be involved. So demanding, again, through the press, that President Obama send a representative to the Vienna conference in December of this year. A personal question for you, Catherine. You've now been involved with Physicians for Social Responsibility for, if my math is correct, 34 years since you started as an intern. How do you keep 
going. The information is so difficult and so devastating, and I know from my own experience, at times can be so depressing. What is it that keeps you involved and keeps you moving forward? Well, I think that the issues that PSR works on are so very important. So the future for my son keeps me working on these issues. Another thing that keeps me moving is the wonderful people I work with. I get to work with very talented people who donate incredible amounts of time, money, and inspiration, really, to all of us to keep moving on these issues. And right now, I see hope. I really see the fact that the international movement is taking off and we have an opportunity to really make a difference. Catherine, as I said, Anything Nuclear Hot Seat can do for PSR on this issue or any of the other issues that you are dealing with internationally, nationally, or locally, you've got airtime anytime you want it or need it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. That was Dr. Katherine Thomason, Executive Director of Physicians for Social Responsibility. The group's website has a tremendous amount of information available, and you can access it all at psr.org. My ebook, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, One Mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and Beyond, is available on Amazon as a Kindle ebook. Right now, it costs about the same as a cup of Starbucks, but if you can't afford that or you're reluctant to pay that for an ebook, Know that in the month of September, to celebrate my birthday, there is going to be a special so that even those of you with the least amount of money at your disposal will be able to get a copy of this ebook. That's coming up in September, or if you wish to support us for the cost of a cup of Starbucks, you can do so now. And again, by supporting the book, you're supporting me, and you've got my thanks. One of my all-time favorite nuclear hot seat interviewees is up next. Carl Grossman just published an important article on informable.com, and I couldn't resist the opportunity to speak with him about it. Carl is an award-winning investigative reporter with more than 40 years of experience and truly is an eminence grise, a gray eminence or wise elder within our community. He knows the footnotes and where all the metaphoric bodies are buried in the entire nuclear issue. Carl is a professor of journalism at the State University of New York College at Old Westbury and the chief investigative reporter for WVVH-TV. He's host of the nationally aired TV program, Enviro Close-Up, has authored six books, including Cover-Up, which you are not supposed to know about nuclear power. But you read the book and you will know it. Here, we talk with Carl about the dangers of nuclear power in space and the recent breakthrough in solar-powered spaceflight that gives lies to the claims of the nuclear industry that you can't go boldly where no one has gone before without nuclear. Here's Carl. I've been investigating the use of nuclear power in space ever since the Challenger accident in 1986, because I broke the story in the nation in 1986 of how the next mission of the ill-fated Challenger was to loft a plutonium-powered space probe. And if the accident had occurred not in January of 86, but May, when that nuclear mission was planned, and that plutonium would have been uh, dispersed in fragments vaporized like uh, so much of the Challenger, it wouldn't have been seven brave astronauts dying. There was going to be pounds and pounds of plutonium that potentially could have been released. So I've been on this story ever since then, and I've looked into, there's been a variety of uh, nuclear shots. What are some of the other nuclear in space stories that have come up since you started covering this back in '86? Perhaps the most dangerous nuclear shot of them all in in recent times was the Cassini mission. That involved 75 pounds of plutonium. Why in the world are they shooting plutonium into space? 
We've used mostly these plutonium radioisotope thermoelectric systems or generators. The Soviets, now Russia, they prefer reactors. The claim had been that when you go far out into space, you'd need nuclear power. Post-Manhattan Project, when those behind that juggernaut looked for things to do with nuclear, food irradiation, nuclear power plants, nuclear-powered airplanes, and then nuclear in space. So it's been something that the U.S. and also the Soviet Union both have been very committed to for many years. We now have the situation with the Rosetta spacecraft. What is the importance and the significance of this particular craft? Here is the Rosetta, solar-powered, rendezvousing with a comet, doing it with solar energy. It's energized by solar panels. For years, for so many years, the claim has been beyond the orbit of Mars, we can't use anything but nuclear as a power source. Uh, Rosetta is showing that hundreds of millions of, we're talking about well over 300 million miles from space. Right now, Rosetta is in the midst of a rendezvousing with this comet, getting its energy, not from plutonium, not from a nuclear reactor, but solar panels, even though at that distance way out in the solar system, the sun is, in terms of the energy being sent out from the sun, a fraction of what it is here on Earth. So it's a, it's a real breakthrough, and it's a breakthrough being done by the European Space Agency. ESA stresses on its website that we do not have nuclear devices for space use, so we began developing solar for space, and they've succeeded. It sounds like these are incredibly sensitive and powerful panels. Might there be applications that we could use down here on Earth to speed our weaning ourselves from all things nuclear and switching over to solar? Yeah, well, these are high-efficiency panels that have been developed. But let me just, just add a wrinkle here. One of the bigger accidents, and this isn't a, a matter of the sky is falling. The sky has, in fact, fallen a number of times with nuclear devices that have been put up into space. And the most serious of the accidents was the SNAP 9A accident back in 1964. It was a satellite energized with plutonium. It wasn't able to maintain its orbit. It came crashing down, disintegrating. Plutonium spread all around the planet. Indeed, Dr. John Goffman of the University of California, or the late Dr. Goffman, University of California at Berkeley, long connected that disaster to a, an increase of lung cancer on Earth. Well, that incident, that event in 1964, caused NASA to develop photovoltaic panels for satellites. And in fact, the crossover to the use of solar power on homes and office buildings and so forth, directly related to a lot of the, the pioneer work by NASA caused by this plutonium accident. However, NASA and the space officials in the Soviet Union and Russia continued to insist, yes, we can, we can use solar for satellites, and all our satellites are now solar-powered, as is the International Space Station. But when we go out into space, we still have to use nuclear. Well, Rosetta shows not true that you can use solar. And back to NASA, right now, NASA has uh, taken the lead from ESA NASA has a mission way out to Jupiter called the Juno space probe. How is it being energized? Solar power. So as on Earth, solar power can easily serve as an alternative to dangerous nuclear power in space. That's so terrific. <laughs> <laughs> I love your enthusiasm for it. It's kind of like, look, dudes, we can do this. Yes. That was award-winning investigative reporter Carl Grossman. What you heard is an excerpt from a longer interview we did that includes a discussion of nuclear weapons in space, Ronald Reagan's Star Wars initiative and why we should still be afraid of that, and much more. The full interview will be running on Nuclear Hot Seat number 169, which will post on September 16, 2014. 
Meanwhile, the link to Carl's current article on solar power in space as a replacement for nuclear, along with a few other places to find his brilliant writing, can be found on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 163. Activist shout-outs. There is a new video from the ever-reliable Myla Reason. It's called Nuke Busters versus Nuke Boosters, and I have it embedded on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 163. I want to publicly express my thanks to enenews.com for consistently picking up on Nuclear Hot Seat's interviews and posting links and great big chunks of transcript on their site. Don't know how he does it that fast or that well, but he does. The three most recent pieces on ENE News have been my two interviews with Steve Simmons of the USS Reagan and Dr. Alec Rosen from the IPPNW taking on the United Nations UNSCIR report that so downplayed the radiation risks at Fukushima. My thanks to ENE News for granting me the honor of placement on your estimable pages. And according to reports from Japan, India's nuclear Gandhi, Kumar Sundaram, knocked it out of the park, or some suitably soccer-related image, in his presentations to the Tokyo Press Club and elsewhere. He's been in Japan ripping the cover off of India's deals with Japan to import nuclear technology. Though why any country would trust Japan, the country that brought you both Fukushima Daiichi and the cover-up, is anybody's guest. Well done, Kumar, and safe journey in all that you do. Here's today's final thought, and boy, is it a fun one. Ask, and ye shall receive. I've been asking, and it looks like delivery is imminent. Regular listeners to Nuclear Hot Seat know that I've been chasing down John Stewart of The Daily Show for over a year. My intention has been to become his nuclear pundit. Well, John has inadvertently opened a door, and I am orchestrating a stampede to go through it on behalf of the anti-nuclear perspective. Here's the deal. John's been doing an ongoing bit on The Daily Show about Rupert Murdoch trying to buy Time Warner Communications. Now, the Time Warner holdings include CNN, which would be in conflict with Fox, which Murdoch already owns and would be loath to give up. So he will have to divest himself of CNN. That's why John Stewart has done what any of us would do. He has started a Kickstarter campaign to buy CNN for $1 trillion. That's what he's aiming for in the fundraising campaign. Oh, and he's providing great bonuses for all who donate. Now, John is asking for help to come up with programming for his new network. He's using the hashtag NewCNNShows with that little hashtag in front of it. These get posted on the Daily Show website and stick around on his Twitter feed and are taken into consideration by his staff. So here's the deal. Help me make the Daily Show aware of Nuclear Hot Seat and our shared anti-nuclear perspective. Here's how it's coming down. Every week, for as long as this opportunity remains open, I will post a new Tweet of the Week to John Stewart on the website NuclearHotSeat.com under each week's show. A lot of you may not be familiar with Twitter. I know that I've been taking a crash course this past week under the tutelage of California activist Milo Reason, who makes all those wonderful videos, Darren McClure, who is one of the activists who helped to close down San Onofre, and the non-nuclear but amazingly skilled Richard Viasana of Marketing to Mexico. I will post these instructions on the site for you to cover, but here's what you will need to do. Go to Twitter.com. If you have an account, sign in. If you don't have an account, open an account and sign in. You must be signed into your Twitter account for this to work. Once you are signed in, go to NuclearHotSeat.com and click on the blog page. Look for this episode, number 163. At the top, you will see my tweet. It will be visible on the website in all its glory. Underneath the wording of the tweet, you will see the words from Twitter, retweet, and favorite. Click on them both. 
click on retweet, and click on favorite. That's it. You're done. Because of coding that I have in the tweet, in my tweet, your clicks will help build the visibility of this post about Nuclear Hot Seat in Twitter land and to the Daily Show staffers who handle this campaign. They will see it. The more people who do this, the greater the visibility of Nuclear Hot Seat and the better the chance that we'll finally get some traction on anti-nuclear awareness on this really important show. I've been going after John Stewart for over a year, mentioning him on almost every show, envisioning myself, intending myself to become his nuclear pundit, either as an on-air spokesperson or as a writer on the subject. Direct approach to these people will not work. It's show business. They are armored against it. It's it's bigger than the Berlin Wall and the Great Wall of China combined. But here's the chance to get word through where they can see it. So my thanks in advance to everyone who helps me make it there. Let's get together and have a party and make some news. In closing, this has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, August 5th, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from ENENews.com, U.S. Department of Defense, U.S. Department of Energy, Minutes of the New Mexico Legislature, Santa Cruz Citadel, San Luis Obispo Tribune, SBC Bay Area, KSBW, the OPB blog, SFGate.com, Indian Country Today Media Network.com, the state.com, KnoxBlogs.com, Counterpunch.org, ENEA Bologna Research Center, Asahi Shimbun, NHK, the American Chemical Society, Japan Times, Ian Fiorele, and the ever vigilant Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. Join us, friend us, and help us tweet about John Stewart. Theme music for Nuclear Hot Seat, written by me, sung by Marilee Weaver. Looks like Weber, sounds like Weber. And we are currently working on a full-length version of the Nuclear Hot Seat theme song. We will have that to you when it is completed and recorded. Hey, I'm looking for somebody who can give me a good punchline to how many nuclear industry professionals does it take to screw in a light bulb? The other one is, how many becquerels of plutonium does it take to screw up a planet? If you have a funny answer, or maybe not a funny one, send it to me at info at nuclearhotseat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV. Our archive is available on iTunes. You can subscribe under podcast to get them all. Or you can go to our newly searchable website and search to your heart's content. We've also got buttons going back about 20 programs. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2014, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved but fair use allowed for nonprofit and not-for-profit organizations, groups, blogs, and websites. You have my permission to reuse this material as long as proper attribution is provided, meaning my name and website. If you are a for-profit media outlet, contact me. I'm extremely reasonable, except when it comes to the nuclear industry. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, Reminding you that we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now, don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. <laughs>